we're rolling already, so. Um, what? Uh, so I actually had a question just like starting off about your name. Yeah. Because I'm, I go by my middle name. Mm -hmm. I, and you go by your middle name, right? Yes. And so tell me about that a little bit. Um, Louis was from uh, two people. Uncle Louis, my, one of my dad's uncles, and also Louis Armstrong. Uh, and then Andre was like uh, Llewellyn, Etienne, Francois. My grand, my grandmère, my grandmother, my dad's mom was uh, was part Corsican. Mm. And uh, that's like, uh, Corsica is to France what Sicily is to Italy. Okay. It's like a stepchild. That's where Napoleon was from. Okay. So, uh, and then my, my grandpa uh, was uh, German by way of uh, when he couldn't get in at Ellis, his people couldn't get in at Ellis Island, they went to Canada and then eventually wound up from Canada in Traverse City, Durand, and then Grand Rapids, Michigan. So that comes from that part. There's nothing in it that my mom got into. She let my dad do it. So uh, Andre was, was uh, some distant relative. Uh, I know there was uh, Andre um, uh, Chardel that had been some distant cousin or uncle. And then the Fisher is, uh, is the family name, was my grandpa's name. My uh, grandmother's maiden name was Roussin, R-O-U-S-S-I-N. There were Rousseau's. I said, well, did they change it from, you know, Rousseau to Roussin? They said, no, there was Roussin's. And then uh, my eldest, my middle daughter and my youngest daughter actually researched it. We found a town on a river in Canada that had been totally settled by the Roussin's that's still there. Hmm. And there's a big uh, oblique or whatever you call it, uh, it near the church. And there's a, a big stone monument with all the names of the Ralsens that still exist. So I said, go ahead, Grandma. So <laughs> that's in Canada. And then my mom's folks, that my, my mom's folks were from uh, uh, Lawrence. Uh, is that North or South Carolina? I think it's South Carolina and Charleston. And my, my mom's mom was uh, uh, a fuller and uh, they they were black but her her um, grandfather was Dutch he owned uh, shoe stores in Charleston and no one knew that uh, he had a black wife he was actually married to uh, my uh, grandmother's mother and and then my uh, grandfather Claiborne Leek his name was Leek uh, he was from somewhere, I think somewhere in Michigan. He'd been born in Michigan. And he went down, I think, to visit relatives in Lawrence and met my grandmother. So Claiborne and Sarah, those are my mom's mom and dad. They both passed uh, when my mom was nine. My grandfather passed from tuberculosis. And when she was 11, her mother passed. She was raised by her great aunt, her and her brother and, and sisters. And my, my dad uh, went to Central High School in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He was born in Duran, but he wound up in Grand Rapids, called Central High School. And my mother went to Central High School. For some reason, that school in Grand Rapids was always integrated. No, it, it never had to be a law or a decree. It was the school, Central High School was always integrated. Uh, and. Uh, Basically, my mom and dad got married when it was against the law. It was illegal for them to be married in 1948. And uh, I, asked, I asked my dad, uh, you know, d did you worry about the implications? He said, look, your mom was the best singer in Central High School, and I was the best trumpet player. He said, I was just trying to keep the band together. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I died at that because he... He taught me that the original United Nations had nothing to do with New York. The United Nations, he said, was bands and musicians. He said, because mm -hmm. usually the criteria for a musician, regardless of what your color is, what you look like, or even if your breath smells, is can he play? Can he or she perform? Mm -hmm. That's usually the criteria. That's it. 
Why you got a fat trombone player? He can play, man. So it didn't matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I remember being told stories about uh, Benny Goodman and uh, him wanting Louis Armstrong and even Lionel Hampton played with him. And he would go places down south that wouldn't let you know, all the members of the band stay in the same place. And he would refuse to perform unless all of his people could be close to him. And it wasn't necessarily that he was for civil rights. He just wanted what the hell he wanted because those were his people. Yeah. You know, so, you know, he, he wasn't waving any other kind of flag other than, I'm Benny Goodman, this is my band. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But uh, th that's, that's uh, the, the name thing, it could have even gone more the, the French way if it had been just my grandmother or my dad because we had a lot of folks with the with, uh, European sounding names and uh, uh, there was folks in the family that made instruments, violins, cellos. Um, there was a couple in France that uh, are still into their late 90s, still functioning, still, uh, still going, some of my grandmother's people. My grandma's gone, my grandpa's gone. And uh, my dad, my mom, my Uncle Claire, my Uncle Dean, um, my Aunt Suzanne, all, they're all, all uh, passed on. But um, my grandpa was, uh, uh, he liked to sing. He was president of barbershop quartets of Greater Michigan, while also he owned a uniform factory. And they had some other businesses, but he was president of barbershop quartets. My grandmother was a choral director for about three or four Presbyterian churches. My uh, Aunt Suzanne was a piano teacher and vocal coach. My Uncle Dean was a bass player. And I think for a short period of time, he was assistant dean of music at Michigan State. Uh, my Uncle Claire was a well-known composer and pianist um, that when they drafted him, he went to West Point as assistant choral director. And then when he left West Point, he became the musical director for the High Lows, which was a famous jazz singing group of, of the late 40s and all through the 50s and early 60s. Then he did George Shearing and then all of Cal Jader's albums, uh, Bud Shank, Lorendo Almeida. It just started blossoming. And then Jerry Goldsmith started using him for film scores and uh, Henry Mancini. And it just a lot because of his composition skills and they called him a blocker. When he played piano on a track, he blocked it out in such a way that it kind of controlled the harmonic. And they liked that, unless it was Johnny Mandel, <laughs> who was a friend of the family. He said, damn it, your uncle blocked the damn thing out again. It doesn't leave me any room, mm -hmm. but to accompany what he's doing as opposed to do my thing with the string arrangement. Mm -hmm. So it, he was slick, but that was my Uncle Claire. I had a big, um, uh, uh, exposure to music through him, but my dad played with big bands. Stan Kitten, Woody Herman, Harry James, Little John Beecher, Lee Williams Orchestra, uh, and uh, the, the last three bands were booked out of National Orchestra Service, which used to be uh, like an agency that booked musicians for territory bands out of Omaha, Nebraska. So we lived in certain cities that you could recruit or get on to a tour. So that's why we lived in Omaha. I was born in Minneapolis because my mother was singing at the Lakeview Club near, near Lake Minnetonka. While my dad was here uh, uh, dealing with the professor uh, who was gonna help him get his final credits in composition back in Michigan State. There was a specialized uh, uh, composition teacher that was here in Minnesota connected with the U of M that he, he came here to see. And in the meantime, my mom booked herself a gig in that club. Her water broke uh, December 25th, 1948, while singing on stage. That's how I got born here. I was born the next day. And they didn't live here at the time. They steered, stayed here long enough for, for her to get back on her feet. Then they went back to, uh, uh, to Grand Rapids. And then from there, we moved to Kansas City, Omaha, uh, and then back to Minneapolis. And I came back here, must have been maybe first grade. Uh, and by then, I think I had a brother or sister born. Um, they were born in, in Omaha. 
and then we stayed here till uh, maybe 1958, 59. I remember the day that uh, the, uh, a lot of clubs were opened here, like the Gay 90s, which is now a, a, a gay club. It was a jazz club. It was owned by a black family. Uh, there was uh, Excelsior Park uh, out near Lake Minnetonka. It was our Six Flags. We had a theme park. We oh, yeah. had a big park here. Yeah, yeah. And there was uh, uh, Axel's Treehouse on TV. And Mel Jazz was the famous TV and radio announcer of that particular day, dialing for dollars. So, in other words, my history here came because they moved back here. And uh, my mom sang with local groups here, uh, Rook Gans, uh, Adolphus Allsbrook. Uh, this was when Oscar Pettiford would come through here and other great jazz musicians. There's a whole history of, of Minneapolis no one talks about, even before the Steele family or the Petersons. There was a lot of people that came here uh, to live and also because Minnesota was kind of uh, neutral. They blamed it, they, they uh, attributed it to the fact that is there was too many Norwegians here in Swedes, and uh, they never uh, colonized anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was kind of crazy. The, the funny part about Adolphus Allsbrook, though, is the bass player. He was a composer and bass player. Eventually, he had narcolepsy. No one would hire him because no one wanted to have to take him home. He was a big man, and he played an upright bass. So uh, I, one night, I think they put him on a streetcar. And the, the, the lady at the boarding house kept calling around because he hadn't shown up. They went to the train yard where the train stopped before it started to ring again. He was asleep in the train car next to his base. So, <laughs> true story. Wow. You know, it, because a couple guys went down with a little brownie cameras and took a picture of it. But there was a whole nother thing here in Minnesota. So, my folks, <clears throat> that's how I came to be from here. Uh, yeah. And we moved other places, then eventually moved back here. And then uh, 1959, moved to California. My uncle had settled there and started doing more and more work, and even uh, commercial work, like for 3M and other countries doing, uh, companies doing uh, uh, music. Okay. Uh, and uh, he, my dad was kind of his orchestrator, as well as handled his publishing. So my dad got off the road, went to California, hung out with my uncle, and then sent for us. And we took the train from Minneapolis to uh, Los Angeles, uh, 1959, here. Because I had grabbed a, uh, it was a compilation of Minneapolis jazz compilation, and there was a jazz label on Excelsior here, Barry. 8,000 Excelsior at one point in time. That's just wild to me to think. But when you think it made the shift from kind of more what it's known for now, like, you know, the, the princes and the kind of and all that, this, I mean, let's be honest, it's not really considered a jazz city much to this time. The, the, a, a shift denotes conscious effort. Okay. There's no such thing. Yeah. When things shift, they shift for exterior, internal and external reasons. It's, it's not a person, it's not a style of music. It's, sometimes it's luck, it's certain things that all of a sudden become dominant as, as other things maybe die away. And it's like, it's like Americans. When Americans have money, they do shit like buy rocks. <laughs> you know, my pet rock. Yeah. Okay, when we don't have money, then we're tight and we tend not to want to hear about it. And we get six packs of Top Ramen. Okay, so things are, things are governed. There's a lot of things that govern these shifts. And also, it depends upon work. It has nothing to do with your culture and creativity. It has to do with how people eat. It's just like Detroit. Uh, if Detroit is a place that all of a sudden has factories that makes cars, what happens when that is no longer? There's a certain portion of the population which has no longer a reason to be there. And the cultural aspects or the local aspects of whatever the place has to offer is not feeding them, so they have to go somewhere else. That's why the great exodus during the, the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, you know, many people were moving west. That's when a lot of black people from southern cities, especially uh, uh, not only directly after slavery, but many years after, especially at the height of Jim Crow, were just moving out of the south. 
You know, now a lot of people are going to Atlanta where many years ago, everybody's trying to get the hell out of Georgia. And usually migration happens straight up. You go straight from Mississippi right to Chicago, North and South Carolina to New York. There's different places you go, but on this migration, you're talking about, uh, you know, after the fall of the stock market during the depression, the move was west, okay? And even when there was, do you know what WPA is? There was, WPA camps were established. The WPA uh, uh, association, not association, but the organization was made by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In essence, it was a form of socialism. The Hoover Dam, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, a lot of things were built during these times because if not, if, if, you, if you can't feed people, you can't run the country. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt put people to work. The majority of federal highways you ride on were originally built during these times where there were work crews, WPA work crews out building highways, railroads, buildings, dams, all over the place. And also they sent actually entertainment to the camps. The camps were actual encampments, like they built them like they would an army encampment. And they'd go work on certain uh, projects uh, that, you know, basically the federal government owns all the land. Even though now uh, we, we think we own things, if there's eminent domain put into practice by the federal government, you may get moved, whether they pay you, you know, for your land or not. It's just like the way they, they did the neighborhoods here. Uh, what's, what's the one, uh, um, Rondo and, and a couple of the other neighborhoods. If you want to break something up, you just claim eminent domain and run a highway through it. Okay, so there's, there's all kinds of stuff uh, in that. But the WPA camps also had uh, trucks, flatbed trucks. They take musicians around to perform for some of the workers. That's where Art Blakey started at 14 years old, playing drums uh, with the WPA band going to encampments to entertain the workers. Okay, that's, that's a few years before he met Billy Eckstein and a couple other folks, but there'd been a lot of musicians that went out on the road in the WPA work camps. You know, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that happened here to, to take us to certain areas which we're not only ignorant of, as far as historically, but if you look closely enough, the history of music, specifically the history of jazz, is the history of the United States. Uh, people say, well, how did Bessie Smith die? She died because of, of racism. She died because in the car accident, the closest hospital was white. And they wouldn't accept her. So they drove her 40 miles away and she died. So, it's, it's, you know, you can't drink out of this fountain. What? What is that? Okay, so a lot of strange things happen. But I find in any civilization that plays king of the hill, um, when you find it necessary to justify your existence by the degradation of another, you, you, the premise is wrong. So in other words, that can last for so long and then it Im implodes on itself. Okay, so actually my mother used to tell me like if, if a bad person or a person deranged or, or just not right in the head does something strange to you, she said you're revenge on them is shouldn't be necessary she said their payment for what they've done is the fact that they're the way they are and I didn't understand that for a long time <laughs> and then finally I figured it out it's like a, a rich asshole who wins a lotto is just a rich asshole so it, it, you just kind of get to that and also uh, all the names that were given I lived in Europe for too many years. I lived in Paris for four years. London for two. I lived in Copenhagen. Uh, I, I lived in Tokyo. I lived a lot of places. Uh, Europeans, Europeans don't call themselves colors. Matter of fact, if you call them a specific color, they get pissed off. They're nationalistic. It's like, what are you talking about? I'm French. Can we put her in the... Or I'm Belgian, you know? It's, it's a whole it's a whole another tip as far as that's concerned it, music music has kind of saved a lot of people's lives 
in a lot of countries. In other words, when, when, when we're hassling with each other, it seems like the only thing that chills us out is a good meal and somebody playing a song on a guitar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Music has been our medicine, especially for people of color. Uh, in, in the black neighborhood, to say that you had a psychological problem was a no-no. You don't share that with anybody. So what was your medicine? Your medicine wound up being part of your culture, which was music and food. Okay, so there's a, a lot of pieces of us that actually acted as medicine, and music has been medicine. Um, what got me pissed off the other day is no matter what people are trying to do the United States, you know, the, the folks who will stick up for it the most are the folks who came here from somewhere else or have been through shit here, who understand that the, the nature of what it is is based upon what you put into it. It's not a title you give yourself. If I make myself entitled, you know, like I'm a king or, 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 or princess, what is that based on? Is it based on I'm over someone? Okay? So in other words, those premises about higher and lower are like a caste system, like in India. So in essence, we're in the caste system. When the lower caste is used as foundation, which the people of color were, that's how the wealth came. Okay? If that starts to move vertically, which means it's trying to leave its place, the top caste tells the middle caste, you got to lock that down. Because if that moves, it messes up our game. Okay, and the game is positions. Okay, what people talk about when they try to be self-righteous is we don't need the positions. There has to be an equality of balance because the thing that sustains us all is the earth. That's what we're neglecting. The first thing man does is he finds a great river and he pisses in it. (laughs) What? What an idiot! So, we, we tend to do things that are dangerous to us. What worries me the most, not even about the word white supremacy or racism or any of that stuff, the titles don't bother me. What bothers me is the actual things that happen, because people talk all the time. At the end of civilizations, there are certain key factors that happen. Morals and ethics are out the window. People don't know what sex they are. Uh, as, as far as those things which are supposed to be normal or status quo or no longer considered that anymore. Uh, in other words, that came at the end of the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, Mesopotamia, the, the time of many people. So if you're, if, if you're a student of history, which most people are not, you see that there are telltale signs that this is, feels like the end, at least of America's turn, of trying to rule and run shit, okay? So that's what I fear the most, is that none of us have been under martial law before, okay? None of us have experienced the same things people in third world countries experience every day. The only people who experience shit that they had to get through and survive through is the people that have been ostracized, okay? So the folks who think that they are superior, which is a ruse, you know, because it's like, Even with white folks, they'll tell a guy, look, you can belong to the country club. You can't play the back nine, but you can belong to the country club because you look like me. When actually, they use him as a buffer. The middle class is used as a buffer. You know, rich folks are rolling in a whole nother level. Okay, so it's like, I don't have a bunker built in my house. <laughs> so what's happening is like if poor white folks and poor black folks ever formed a union, <laughs> that shit would be tight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's what the problem is. It's, it's yeah. your place in, in, in the cast. It's, it's not what color you are. That's a ruse. That's just a ruse. Because bottom line is, can I feed my family? Can I, can I have a safe life? Can I get from point A to point B? Yeah. A bicycle, car, anything. In other words, certain things we need, we think we need to, in order to exist. Plus Americans, they don't deal with what they need, they deal with what they want. What you need is very simple. What you want is ridiculous. <laughs> so that's kind of what I see going on. And through it all, we have to grab onto things like medicine or as some kind of anchor to, to calm our souls, which is yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, It's music and art. It's, it's, uh, 
It's intimacy with your woman. It's food. It's different things to, to quell us because yeah. in, in essence, we're animals that walk upright. Mm -hmm. You know, and our whole primal instinct is hunter gatherers. We never properly figured out what to do with that. Or it's just like in the army, uh, 82nd Airborne. I'm dealing with all these people going to Lackland Air Force Base for military police uh, teaching, training, you know, before getting shipped over to Tansanut or Da Nang or Saigon, you know, and after the war's over, all those people who were trained to kill you are now the police that police the corners of the city I live in. They weren't de-escalated, they weren't detrained when they came home. Okay, so when you train a force that's there to search and destroy and you bring it home now to be the hall monitor of your neighborhood, there's something wrong in that. There has to be a de-escalation or a retraining, okay? And uh, it's, it's hard to, even if you justify the fact that you've taken a life, uh, you know, to, to walk around knowing that that is something that is in your par view, that you have the ability to do all the time. It means there should be a reverence and that you should always be, you know, very, very high-minded in having to deal with other people because of that. If not, it's like Judge Dredd, you know, I mean, the whole point of your existence is to make it through this this little minefield of all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would walk to a, a bus stand with my mother, and a little kid would come up to me and say, "Is that your maid?" Uh, you know, black kids didn't like me because I couldn't play basketball. Two, um, they thought I thought I was better because of my skin color. White kids didn't like me because I couldn't play basketball. <laughs> and, and also because I didn't fit the stereotype. My, my, what I said, what I thought, you know, the fact that I could do certain things, it didn't, it, it didn't fit whatever they'd been told by their parents because kids aren't born that way. Okay? And also, too, my upbringing here in Minnesota was totally different than my upbringing once we moved to California. A quick example, Minnesota, you have a little fight with a friend, knocks you down, gives you his hand, says, you done, you want to be friends now? <laughs> That's my memory of Minnesota. Now, it could be totally warped. As a little kid, I would go to California, somebody knock you down, he calls five of his friends to come over to stomp you to death. Totally different. So I, I met another level of people who meant me harm when we moved as a kid. As a matter of fact, I got ostracized from being from Minnesota. Why are you so nice? Or like, why do you always say yes, ma'am? You know, or I'd open a door for someone and they'd look at me like I was crazy. You know, mm -hmm. or New Yorkers. Um, you got a flat tire, right? Somebody from California drives by and stops and says, oh gosh, that's such a, sorry about that, you got a flat tire. Keeps driving. A New Yorker. What are you, stupid? You got a flat tire? Give me the jack. He'll yeah. change your tire. He'll talk trash about you the whole time, but he'll change your tire. <laughs> so you have to judge that. So sometimes people have been very, what you think is nice, but they're not willing, really willing to give of themselves. Right. Where a New Yorker talks trash, but winds up giving you the shirt off his back. I've just seen it. Yeah. Or when I moved back to Minnesota um, after years, uh, the, the essence I got, even after talking to a lot of people who were musically inclined, and oh, you, you, gosh, you've done all these things, and you won all these Grammys. Why would you move back here? And I looked at him and I said, Well, what must you think of where you live to say something like that? Yeah, it's like I ain't shit, or I ain't into shit, or this place ain't shit. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Dude, you're you're warped. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to figure this out. But but. Uh, all that people could tell me when I came here is I worked with Prince. Mm. I said, this guy kicks a door open and all you could do is work for him? Don't you write songs? What do you do? Mm -hmm. It was a side man's mentality. Yeah. A lot of people I run into here have a worker's mentality. 
It means they don't really want to take responsibility for anything. They're really looking for leisure time. I'm going to the cabin. I get off on diesel fuel and accomplishing things. That relaxes me. You can't send me to Tahiti to unwind. You can send me to New York. In other words, I've been raised with a grind. Speaking of grind. You know, yes, go ahead. My question, what I, which I wanted to... My, my passion... All this started because you asked me, I know. why do I call myself I Andre? My passion, Jesus. my passion is helping musicians and bands and artists I see. understand what it really takes to make it. You know, and, and I know, you know, you've accomplished a lot and I know you got a philosophy on that. But my, first, my question to you is, when, when Rufus first started, mm -hmm. but for, well, one, I'd love to get the background on that band a little bit, but my main question is, what was the business structure of the organization you had for Rufus? But like, did you have a lawyer? Did you have an agent? Did you have a manager? Were you the manager? What, how did, and, and, and how did you run that business? Because I think, I think young musicians really don't understand that you need these things in place or you need somebody that at least knows how to do some of this stuff, a mind for it. And you need to, and the other thing that I think peop, that young musicians don't understand is you got to pay for, you got to pay. You, you're, you, like you were saying yesterday when we were talking on the phone, a record company is a bank, right? Mm -hmm. So you're either going to borrow the money or you're going to pay it up front. Wh which, wh which way do you want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of musicians think there's some guy with a cigar that's just throwing money around, right? Just like throwing money at you and going, okay, you're so talented, here's a bunch of money, you know? So that, anyway, that's... It, it's um, two things. One thing is... Um, the majority of people I speak to, whether it be, doesn't matter where they're from or what their age is, um, they have anxiety. And what I've found over the years is a lot of anxiety is caused by fear of the unknown. And what we tend to do in that situation when we don't really know, we compartmentalize it. We make it so it's less harmful to our, either our ego or our fight or flight, whatever it is, and then we tend to want to put it in a drawer and, and put it away for a minute. Uh, what we don't understand is you've put so much misinterpreted and mislabeled things in the wrong drawers, and now these drawers have all piled up. It's like, it's like putting a wolverine in a closet and locking the door. Something's trying to get out because it's all wrong, okay? And what it does is it also stops you from taking chances, okay? Part of life, part of, uh, it's like a, a butterfly in the cocoon. If you open the cocoon and take it out, although its wings are formed, it won't fly. Part of the process of a chicken breaking the egg is the struggle to get out of it. That's what, what gives it its essence. So what we tend to do to quell our anxiety is look for shortcuts. But these shortcuts, instead of being real shortcuts, are just rationales to put the shit in the drawer to put it away for another time, okay? And the reality of it is, is we make the music business sound romantic or we make it sound mystical or evil and and that's based upon you don't know shit about it okay so you're making up myths about the shit what it is is it's an american business its form is no different than campbell's soup which means i have the copyright and control the rights to this product I control the name of it, I control how it's manufactured, how it's distributed, and what the perception is of how much it's worth and what I can charge for it. And then distribution, you know, there's a, uh, there's a couple other things I can add, but that's called control. 
So most American businesses run over. The, the way they run is they're in control of all these aspects of what the business does. Now, when we were younger, certain businesses also had moral and ethical um, devices built in in how some of the countries, uh, some of the companies ran. You know, saying, you know, our product is this and we, you know, this is for the people. We'd say certain things, okay. About the 70s, 80s, even before then, through the bankers, but by then, in the 80s, it started being that who you were answerable to wasn't morals or ethics, it was the shareholders. And if the shareholders didn't give a damn about general public or whether it was moral or ethical, that, that's all you had to know, okay? That's like the companies that made money off of COVID, you know? Or how could someone feel to know that I've made money off the misery of someone else? How do you justify that? Question, record company. I'm the record company, I've signed R. Kelly, okay? Five, six years doing great with albums, all right? Now, this is, this is a true story because Neil Portnow was vice president of that particular company. Neil Portnow was also president of 20th Century Fox Records. He was also president of the Grammys. All right, those 20th Century Fox, I was a VP of publishing development there. He was my boss, okay? On the Grammys, as a trustee and on the board of governors, Neil Portnow was president of the Grammys, all right? Then he's with the Jive Zamba, okay? I asked him down to a talent show called Big Break. The host was Natalie Cole. I was the producer of that show. R. Kelly won the contest. It was like a talent contest. Neil came down, that's where he got signed, all right? So Neil signs a production deal, and it was, it was R. Kelly in, in the name of his group. Well, he dropped the group, and the deal was made with him, okay? So his production company would supply Jive Zamba with his product. All right. Here's a question I posed to a music class of mine. Okay, six years later, R. Kelly's getting ready to go to court. Okay, he's getting ready to be tried for something. All right. We have his sixth record on the shelf. It's just been finished. When did we release the record? <laughs> One girl raises her hand and she says, when's he going to trial? I said, a week. She said we release it in a week. Why? Because we don't have to worry about what to spend on marketing. <laughs> right. He'll already be in the public eye. Yeah. Just make sure we have end caps in record stores and his, his own uh, record bed, not with mixed with others, but stuck out on purpose. Okay. So I go, hmm, okay. As a company, I, I pose the question to the students as if we were the company. Jive Zamba, yeah. okay? I said, now what do we say in public based upon the fact that we have this relationship and should we be aware that if we show positive reaction towards him and the public is going against him, is that dangerous for us? Guy raises his hand. He said, we do a Clive on him. So what do you mean we do a Clive? He said, the Milly Vanilli way. I said, what way is that? He said, Clive Davis signed Milly Vanilli knowing that they weren't the ones singing. But since it was a production deal, it's once removed from the family. So you can blame it. So what did Clive do when they took the Grammy back? He blamed it on the production company he made the deal with. In other words, it's you signed it, it's in your house, but here's a way to to deflect it off of mm -hmm. it. So what's, what I'm listening to while this is going on is the degree in which these students are into mayhem, okay, morals and ethics. Then I say, well, I need an opinion. Um, say that uh, uh, the mother uh, goes into the court and doesn't like, you know, what, what the uh, outcome is and pulls out a pistol and empties a clip in his chest. Then someone looked at me and said, well, in that case, we don't release the sixth album. We release the best of for the next 15 years and add one track off the sixth record as a, 
as a bonus track for the next 12 years. Wow. I said, that's record company thinking. I said, but morally and ethically, is, is that sound? In other words, our final judgment may not be for record sales, it may be for who we supported, what was our posse like, okay? So I asked another student a question. I said, what is your opinion of this if any of these things go down? And he said, do you want my personal opinion or do you want my opinion as an employee of Jive Zamba? Which meant in his mind, he'd already divided the two. I hadn't divided the two, you know, in my age group. And I, and I sat there and I said, holy shit. The level of, of mayhem that each of them had associated with the business the situation and the morals and ethics to me at that moment was in the toilet. So my fear at that point was they've made the game the God and have taken God off his pedestal and replaced it with a, with a gold scooter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that, that, that really got, got me around. So getting back to the companies again, it's an American company, all record companies are. And you gotta remember that a creative person, whether it be somebody who does poetry or just finger paints, someone who has those thoughts of making art or music, what must your dreams be when you go to bed? It's dreams of creativity. A merchant whose job is to sell, market, and sell those records, his mindset is not the same. Based upon what the student said, what I know companies to be like, the morals and ethics on the side that's promoting you is not the same as yours as the creator. And if your job as the creator is to only make money off of it, okay, what are you, there's nothing to covet. It's only a product. And in America, products don't always take on moral or ethical levels. It's just supply and demand, do I like it or not? All right, where the only thing which kept our country, when, when uh, the only thing that when Trump said, what's he saying, make America great again? For people of color, it was never great. Right. Okay, so if he's talking about make it great again, the only time I could think it was great it was when everybody was scared of God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that there, were, that there were morals and ethics and every night when a little kid before he went to bed, whether if he was Jewish or, but there was, there was something spiritual involved. Mm -hmm. What I sense now, it's, it's, it's like a singularity. It's have and have not. And there's only a small difference I see now that, that separates us from a third world country. And the middle class was it. Uh, but you give the middle class the illusion of mobility. And it, what do middle class people say? Well, I may not be rich, but I don't, I don't, I'm not poor either. Or I don't have to be poor, all right? Where poor folks are like, they're just, I'm just, you know, trying to get a cracker, all right? Where rich folks say, why don't they help themselves? It's like, it's like telling somebody they're free. And then the first thing you do when they go to buy a house is say, we, we can't give you a loan because you're not white and you can't live here because you're not white. Then what must you think of yourself? And then now what do you do in a place you're told is this homogeneous melting pot we're all supposed to live here? The only time we get along is in certain areas, certain parts of culture, certain parts of art, you know, I'd fight a third world war just for all the music and art that we've put together in the past couple hundred years that's made in America. Jazz is American. A lot of the music and the things that we've done here artistically are things we've made through struggle, through good times and bad times. It's ours. From all the artists that we've come up through, everybody from Hank Ballard to Hank Williams, you know, I'd knock somebody off as far as wanting to destroy this country because we're better than the things we say we want because what we need is very simple and sometimes we've already given it to ourselves and that and that's 
having fear of nature, which is sometimes fear of God, you, 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 you don't pee in the water. You don't, you don't mess up the thing that sustains your life. And then the parts of your culture that you've used as medicine have to be coveted. You, they, it has to be honorable. In other words, the problem with us is we've, we've lost our honorability. And that becomes a problem and there's ways to get it back. You, know, it's, you could slowly walk up on it. It's not, let's run to it. Our whole thing as Americans, because we think we're going to miss something, is that we've been number one in the world because we've had the biggest Navy, we've had the biggest guns, and we've loaned everybody money. First, first thing we did after the Second World War, who put Germany back together? Who put Japan back together? Who put shit together after you blow it up? Mm -hmm. we, we, there were bonfires of brand new SUVs and equipment and printers in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't let me get into that. Okay, <laughs> that, that's a whole other can of peace. But but while all this was going on, what were we doing at home? We were listening to music. We were trying to get the shit off us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we we do things that make ourselves feel better. Yeah. How many things do you know that you can get that make you feel better? Where when it's over with, you're not addicted to it. You won't be arrested for it, and you don't owe a million dollars for it. Yeah. You know, or something that can make you feel immediately and you have no control over it. Mm -hmm. I heard a song the other day and I just start crying. It reminded me of my dad. Yeah. There, there was no control over it. Yeah. What, just to think to be able to deal in, in some art like that that can communicate that. Yeah. What a wonderful thing. Because half yeah. the people can't say it to each other. Yeah. They can't say, I'm sorry. They can't say, I love you, man. So like, here's a song, yeah. <laughs> but at least it's something, Yeah, you know, as far as communication is concerned. But back to the companies again, uh, they're American companies. It is an American company. And also, I got to tell creative people who always say there's a misinterpretation from salespeople or record companies. They don't protect my culture or they put out gangster rap or they they don't you know protect my you know the music of my neighborhood or they're not true to this that's not their job mm -hmm. the cr the creator has to be protector too it's like now you're expecting someone whose job is to sell things to now be protector of a culture yeah that's not their job yeah well that's that's one of the things i was going to ask you is you know going back to the your organization as Rufus, right? Before, but before you got signed, Rufus, but, but as Rufus, you got Rufus signed. had been the American breed. Bend me, shape me any way you wanna. They'd already been a group before they were ever Rufus. They already had a manager. They already had a record deal. They were already on American Bandstand. Okay. So a couple of the members, core members, were from American breed. Okay. I took Lee Graziano's place, who was the drummer. Okay. Okay, because he wanted to go run his, his uncle's car lot or something. I don't remember. <laughs> no, I don't remember the exact reasons, yeah, but, yeah. but I went and auditioned and he liked me. Okay. And I said, oh, I've been friends with him ever since. He's a sweetheart. But I'm saying that was a unit that had advice, that it had a record deal, okay. that had already seen success. And they were the top club band in Chicago when I joined them. Rush That's Up, weird. Rush Over on Rush Street, Mothers. Uh, all those clubs, the, the Red Lion Inns in Bloomington and, and, and Schuler's in Michigan. And I mean, we did the circuit. I remember uh, when I joined the band, you know, Paulette McWilliams was the vocalist. That's who wound up singing with Luther Vandross as a background singer. Paulette was singing lead. Charlie Colbert was singing and playing kungas, but he was the original bass player from uh, um, American Breed. Al Siner, the guitarist from American Breed, was playing guitar. The bass player was uh, uh, Dennis Belfield, uh, and Ron Stockert was the other keyboard players, like our version of Elton John. But before Dennis was the bass player, Willie Weeks was the bass player. That's who wound up with Donny Hathaway on Donny Hathaway Live and wound up as Winona Judge musical director. And he, by way of Carolina and Minneapolis, he wound up in, in Chicago as bass player for Rufus, all right? A guy named Jimmy Stella, who was one of the singers as well. Uh, but Paulette was the only female that they had at the time. 
And the other guitar player for American Breed, and one of the singers was Gary Loizzo. Gary Loizzo became a producer of the Styx records. Okay, so that's the history back with that. Charlie Colbert from uh, uh, American Breed wound up doing jingles and commercials for Leo Burnett ad agency and also for the Barbara Proctor ad agency in Chicago, which was still in music, but it was for advertising for uh, uh, Greyhound bus and American Airlines, those kinds of things. So when I joined Rufus, we were also doing jingles too. Boone's Farm Wine. You know, I did voiceovers for all kinds of stuff for Leo Burnett because the Rufus guys were into that. We had two nine-passenger Dodge Polara station wagons, an equipment truck, and two roadies. That's the group I joined. Before that, I'd been Chitlin Circuit, Jerry Butler, Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions, um, uh, uh, Solomon Burke, a J.C. Davis band, a guy who played Please, Please, Please on James Brown, had a house band in Columbus, Ohio, that all the acts came through the Bottoms Up Club. I was the drummer. You know, I toured with different, the Bobby Blue Bland tour. Don't get me started. That'd take three hours just to run that shit. So to you. let me get back to, to the American Breed. So American Breed decides that they're no longer going to do the straight pop. So they changed their name to Smoke. Right? That's when they get Paulette in the band. That's when they get some other members come in. That's when Willie Weeks comes. All right. Uh, they get a record deal with Sandy Linzer. Sandy Linzer was a producer who had a production company who was doing some stuff for RCA and a couple other labels. He did a group called Odyssey. I'm a native New Yorker. If you remember that song. Well, Sandy Linzer. Sandy Linzer's production sounded like Sandy Linzer. He just got different groups to put in there, but it was basically Sandy Linzer, the same voicings, the same arrangements. So they did a record with him that didn't happen. After that, Willie left. Dennis Belfield comes in. They changed from Smoke now to Ask Rufus, right? Uh, they, then I think they get, uh, Kevin Murphy was already, already there, the keyboard player. So now they're called Ask Rufus. That came from an article in uh, Mechanics Illustrated or Science Illustrated. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a column called Ask Rufus. That's where they got the name from. Interesting. It wasn't from Rufus Thomas or nobody else Rufus. It's from a magazine, okay. all right? So that's when I'm working for Richard Evans, who's a great producer, uh, Peebo Bryson, Feel the Fire, uh, Ramsey Lewis, a lot of different people. It was Dinah Washington's last bass player. That was my mentor in Chicago. He would have me doing sessions, Eddie Harris, uh, James Moody, uh, a lot of different people that Richard had me doing. He's the one who knew Charlie Colbert, because Charlie Colbert from Ask Rufus would get him to arrange the jingles he was doing for Leo Burnett. So he sends me to go sit in with Ask Rufus at Rush Up on Rush Street that night, okay? I sit in with them. I'm in that night, okay? Okay. So I brought them my influences, who my relatives were. That's how Claire wound up doing the string arrangements on all the Rufus stuff, was because each of us brought what we had to the table. Yeah. It's like if you surround yourself with generals, nobody's trying to lead the room. Yeah. You're all sitting there smoking cigars because each of you know your specific job you have to do. So we got together then. They had a manager. His name was Barry Fox. Okay. They had an agent that Barry would use to book us in the clubs and the other places. As soon as you decide you want a record deal, everything changes. Because then you talk about writing original tunes. You're not going to play covers. All right. You're going to do original tunes. Then you got to go woodshed. Then you got to put it together. During that time, you're not working those clubs, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And during that time, the agent isn't interested in you because you're not available, okay? The manager wants his percentage. If you're the only one he manages, he puts pressure on you. If you're not, his concentration goes towards them, okay? What Rufus did was sat down together, we pooled our resources, and instead of putting together a tape to send to somebody, hopefully that they'd open off their desk, you know, people even gave us suggestions like put it in a neon envelope. <laughs> okay, right. they gave us all of, you know, yeah. all the things uh -huh. to get somebody's attention. Yep. You know, have, pay, pay someone who sings, sings, you know, you pay them to go sing happy birthday. Uh, yeah. Yeah, send them to go there and present the tape. Yep. You know, so <laughs> we sat down and we said, who do we know? 
there was a gentleman named Bob Monaco who had just gone to Los Angeles from Chicago. He worked at Wooden Nickel uh, label in Chicago, and he'd been quasi involved with the American breed. Okay, so he goes to be a new A and R at ABC Dunhill Records, which had the Grassroots, which had Three Dog Night, which you know that caliber of of, of artist. So. Um, we say to ourselves, well, he knows the guys in Rufus, okay? What do you need when you go to a record company as a brand new A&R man? What do you need? An artist. An artist. <laughs> okay, so in other words, how do you influence him? So we know he just went there, and he went there because he needed money. So we sit together, we pool our money, and instead of us trying to get him a tape, we arranged to fly him to Chicago put him up and bring him to the club we were going to perform the songs in, in front of a live audience. He said yes. We sent him the money, we picked him up, we sent him the ticket. We, we brought him to us. And now was Chaka Khan in the band? No. Yeah. She, okay, she was singing. Well, by, if, if you want to go into that, Shaka was singing with a group called Lock and Chain, a couple other local groups there in town. She was 17. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if she was 18 yet. Um, the guys in the group weren't particularly enamored with her because she was like a little hippie. Where Paulette was polished and, you know, new wig and, you know, shiny looking like a magazine cover. Night and day. And the guys were head more towards cleaner than grungy. Okay. Okay. We got to remember they'd come from American breed, which was totally pop. Okay. All right. So... What happens is uh, uh, I see Shaka singing in a club on the south side of Chicago called the Pumpkin Room. And I bring Charlie with me, the guy from Rufus and also the guy I told you got the Leo Burnett hookup. He's original member, he goes with me. He said, well, uh, Andre, you're showing me the singer. We already know about her. I said, man, if we're gonna do a new record, this is the, this is the voice. You know, I've been playing with a lot of people, and I saw that being in a group meant you got out of it what you put in it. As opposed to a side man, didn't matter what you put in it. It's the same bread, it's the same list of tunes somebody gives you every night. So I, I got into this, and I politicked for Shaka. Uh, the guys in the group weren't necessarily thrilled because Paulette said she now wanted to go do something else. So they were gonna lose the female vocalist, the black female vocalist, which was squeaky clean, which they thought was what they needed to get a new record deal, okay? When she decides to go, now they're gonna depend upon Ron Stockert, the keyboard player, to be like, you know, the new Elton John, right? So I hear Shaka's voice and immediately, my instinct, the hairs went up on my back of my neck and I'm like, you know, uh, she starts to sing fourths instead of thirds, she hears, you know, this is not a Baptist girl. This girl is coming Catholic Church. She got some other stuff going on. All right. Mm -hmm. She hears different voicing. So, and plus she was young. I saw past whatever they were looking at, and uh, the deal was is they made me the babysitter. If you mm -hmm. want her in the group, you have to pick her up. You have to help mm -hmm. change her clothing. In other words, it was my job to be the fixer and trainer uh, if if I wanted her in the group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, she, she, she'd already been around. They were familiar with her. They didn't particularly like that. <laughs> uh, I politicked to the point where I didn't jeopardize my position, but they were looking at me like, damn. So it was on me to, to do that. So we brought her in the group. We rehearsed. Paulette stayed on long enough to transition some of the songs. Some of the songs were starting to be original. So that's the group that was together that rehearsed when Monaco came out, when we sent for him, all right? So we'd spend a lot of wood shedding, canceled a lot of gigs, you know, to go and shed and, and do these new tunes. And some of the tunes were tunes were new, but we were already doing them live. So in other words, they were already together because we'd already been performing some of the original tunes live. So, so was your philosophy like, this will cost us a lot less, we don't have to make a demo? Yeah, or but, what, but what was the, the philosophy, what, just what? expediency? Yeah, or? yeah but, but, but that's from someone who, who lives in their head, that question. <laughs> right. Okay, because <laughs> what it, it, it's too succinct. 
Okay. All right. What happens is when you're doing these things, it's, it's not one thing you light on. Because when you're sitting in a room with, with five or six other people, there's a multiplicity of ideas that sure. come through. The ones that get accepted are the ones that either least point of resistance, whether it be financial or mental, or the ones that's the hardest because they say, well, what the fuck, we got nothing to lose. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's, there's all kinds of ways to approach it. So yeah. the point is, is it was looked upon is like, isn't this cool that we know somebody, first of all. Yeah. Two, we're sending for them so in essence there's a bit of control in that yeah we're yeah. not in his turf yeah he's coming to ours but he he there's a familiarity he has because he already knows some of the people yeah so when he comes and he sees us we blew him away especially with Shaka. he had never seen her before right right well i always find i just to cut in i always find that almost any success story starts out with something that happened that's not orthodox so a key thing happens that's well we sent our demo in th through our lawyer to the a and r guy and he came out the next week and signed us like that that very rarely happens it's almost like there's something that happens in these stories that's yeah, but, but, like but, magic or, but, or but you're, you're talking you're talking about process yeah what's what's left out is the fact of what was the content oh well well yeah yeah but see that's the first thing i go with yeah sure. that's not the, <laughs> it's not the secondary that's yeah. the primary yeah yeah if there's I no guess. content i don't give a damn who came out right right there had to be a reason sure. to maintain the interest once you did the rest if not just because somebody brought you out and was paying for your room and you're sitting there eating on them that doesn't that doesn't uh, uh, change your opinion about what you're getting ready to hear right because right. you're already working for a company as a new A&R man yeah if you find something great if not it's no skin off your neck right okay so when he came and he was blown away he saw the possibility just like we did so we said okay we got him so far he went back to ABC Dunhill told him he, he was definitely into this. He came back to Chicago less than two weeks later with a work budget. And the working budget, we booked a studio called Paragon, which where the Ohio players did all their stuff and other people. Marty Feldman was the owner and he had this studio in Chicago. We recorded there. We did 11 tunes in a day. We spent all night long doing overdubs and, and background vocals. Uh, 11 songs wow and he took that back a day after took it back to los angeles called us all said we had to come out there to record that abc dunhill was was offering us a a seven-year recording contract and basically this would be his first signing as a and r guy and also there's something that he knew that there was things internally in the company some of the groups were having problems or the A and B positions of marketing money were changing. Three Dog Night was having internal problems. They needed something to put in the slot, the marketing slot. He didn't have it. Grassroots was over. They were trying to sign some other groups, but it, it, it wasn't the same. They didn't have serious thing that they could count on, all right? So what happens is uh, uh, Monaco stuck us in there. We did the first album. We drove to Los Angeles. We went to Torrance and worked in a studio that really wasn't the best studio, but he was getting kickback from the studio owner for using it. So to me, that was Chicago coming through. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little, that's a little, little scammy stuff. So anyway, we're recording out at this place out in Torrance. That's the last place I would have recorded. We did the first album with Who's Ever Thrilling You Is Killing Me. That's an Alan Toussaint song. We did Maybe Your Baby and Made Some Other Plans, Stevie Wonder. We did a couple other things. We got limited airplay, got a couple of gigs out of it. And then uh, we got ready to do the second album. In those particular times, if your first album didn't kill it, it didn't matter. That they were in at least for two records before they'd start talking trash to you. And we didn't take a heavy uh, cash uh, advance because we all knew it's recoupable. You know, a lot of people don't do the homework. Oh, free money. No, it's recoupable. So anyway, the second album is when we did the Tell Me Something Good. Uh, 
we're friends with uh, uh, Ollie Brown and, and I've been friends with Stevie Wonder since my road days, my other days. Uh, he, uh, Ray Parker is also a friend, wrote a song with Shaka called You Got the Love. And then uh, Ray and uh, Ollie get Stevie to come down and that's who brought us to Tell Me Something Good. All right, so that uh, goes that on. That was our, his song? Yeah. Oh, that's Stevie's song? Yeah, but oh. Stevie, Shaka finished it. She never got credit for it because Stevie doesn't split publish it. Interesting. Okay. No. If you want a Stevie song and you did the bridge, so what? It doesn't matter. It's a Stevie Wonder song. Wow. It happens all the time. So anyway, uh, it's just like Evergreen. Ask Paul Williams. You know the little short guy, songwriter Paul Williams? Yeah. Who's head of uh, 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 AFTRA? No, is it ASCAP, had an ASCAP? He got in problems with Barbara Streisand over Evergreen because she didn't want to give him full credit for the writing of the song. It's because, well, I'm the star, that kind of thing. Yeah. It happens all the time. And I don't know if those were the exact words, but that's what it looked like in, in general public. Anyway, uh, uh, ABC Dunhill, uh, we do the second record back in Torrance again. Stevie comes in. We're a little bit more uh, cohesive as far as the band is. Yeah. Because now this is our second record, plus we played together already. Dennis Belfield was a good writer. Ron Stockard, serious pianist. So that's when Tell Me Something Good and You Got the Love came out. Um, when Tell Me Something Good was picked as a single, which we did as a joke, by the way, we didn't like the song. We did it as a joke. The, the, the bass drum is a plastic trash can I'm using a mallet on. The bass player played the bass through the Fender Rhodes bottom. We put gorilla grunts on it. But <laughs> it's, a whole other, it's a whole other story. Wow. We thought a song called uh, Smoking Room and You Got the Love, we thought those were stronger songs for Rufus. Yeah. And they, when Tell Me Something Good was picked as a single, three of the members quit. The guitar player that had been an American Breed, one of the founding members, quit. Ron Stockert, the, the guy who was the, the new Elton John, quit. And the bass player, Dennis Belfield. Dennis went on to be Three Dog Night's bass player and wound up writing songs with Chris Christopherson and Rita Coolidge. Okay, Ron Stockert went on to play multiple recording sessions. Uh, Wild Hearts Run Free, Candy Staten, and a lot of other things he and I both played on. We did a lot of session work, even when we weren't together as a group. And Al Siner wound up producing an album on Paulette and doing some other stuff and moving back to Chicago. Okay, So those three guys quit. They didn't want to play that song for the next 25 years. They didn't think that was the best musical thing on what they contributed and spent all this time doing. So when they left, I went out and got Bobby Watson and Tony Maiden, who I played with in high school. I'd known them since the 11th grade. We played at a club called Mavericks Flat uh, in Los Angeles that we backed up a lot of artists. And they'd been in a, a rock horn band in Illinois and in the Midwest from California called High Voltage. Also, they played on Nothing From Nothing, Leave Nothing. They played with Billy Preston. So uh, they'd had recording experience. And one of the Whispers' first bass players was Bobby. So Bobby also started playing guitar first, then he went to bass. And then so Bobby and Tony were like a matched pair. They'd been with High Voltage. I get them to join the group. And then a pianist who played with Willie Hutch, who was an R&B artist, had a lot of good records. Uh, and he was also very jazzy. He liked McCoy Tyner. Okay, so he was the new keyboard player who was left with myself, Shaka, and the organ player, Kevin Murphy who's from uh, Minneapolis, okay? So the three of us were left, so I went out and got three new people. We immediately go in and record Rufus Eyes, Stop On By. We, we, we immediately went in and recorded with the new unit. That becomes a hit record on its own merits. It's not based off the Tell Me Something Good because it's not the same people anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that all happened because we put our money together we brought the A&R to us or whoever was going to make the judgment or take back to someone to see if they wanted to sign us. So our intention was is to have partial control in our hands uh, to control the perception of what we thought we were worth. In other words, people, based on how you present yourself, 
if you present yourself as a whole, somebody's going to try to give you twenty dollars. Mm-hmm. For, okay. Yeah. So in other words, it's it's how you present yourself. You have to control the perception, and that's what I told you about the companies. Yeah. It, the reason why the record companies tanked out is because when it went to start being given away online, it was no longer physical product. They could no longer control the perception of what it was worth. Okay. If I'm Victor Records in 1909, I have a Victor Record shop, and it's a glass cylinder, and it's a thing. Okay. If I control that, the only place you can get that Victor record is from Victor Store. One day a guy convinces the Victor Store to sell him multiple copies wholesale. As soon as he did that, he just took away the exclusivity of his own product and also to control the perception of what it was worth. Because as soon as it went to wholesale, it changed the whole thing. So the whole thing is to be in control of what people perceive as your worth. If I'm Campbell Soup, and, and I don't make minestrone, but I make the good chicken noodle, but Progresso comes along with a minestrone. What does Campbell's do? They don't have time to make up a minestrone, so they find a little independent somewhere that's making some badass minestrone. They pay them to lease it. That's what Clive did with Bad Boy Records. He wanted to compete in the rap game, but he couldn't sign it to Arista. Not with Aretha Franklin, Dionne Warwick, Melissa Manchester, and Barry Manilow. Biggie ain't gonna fit in that, all right? So what he does is he makes a deal with Puffy. If Puffy dies tomorrow, where do his masters go? They go to Clive, okay? So in essence, how do I get in another marketplace without directly being involved? I lease, I buy, I do those things. If I want to sell Toyota, but yet I'm a Mercedes dealer, I have a friend and go make another deal and we buy that dealer too. That's what you do. Mm-hmm. All right, so in, in essence, there's a, lot of ways that, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. The first thing is to be able to control what your product is worth. The best way we can do it as independents is through live performance. The majority of the groups that I saw when we came up from my era were, were hell bent on leather when you got on stage. The, the, the essence of all of the bands, and we opened for Elton at Wembley with 100,000 people. We opened for the Rolling Stones the whole year in 1975. We opened for The Who. We opened with Little Feet. We toured with uh, Kiki D uh, all through Europe. Uh, you know, there's, there's the Hughes Corporation. We were the first ones to bring the Commodores on the road. They were a Tuskegee College band. We brought them to open for Rufus. Funkadelic opened for Rufus. So all of these, all of these things w- were done back in a time where when you hit the stage, it was the hell or high water. We're here, we don't live here, our only reason here is to kick ass. And, and the live shows were always better than any of the records you bought, okay? And the closer you sounded to your record and even better, that's where you got your money from. We didn't make our money off royalties because the deals were always screwed. They weren't for, you know, 50%. You know, it's like 12 points, 8 points, you know, and those points weren't based upon off 100 points. It was usually 12%, you know, 15% off of 60%, not off of 100. And then, then they, they also cross collateralize all the funds, so you couldn't take one way they sell it as a, as a revenue stream and just get the money from that. They threw it all in the same pot and you had to wait. Okay, and then they did a thing for uh, returns. In other words, if we send out 10 CDs or 10 records to a store, and the store only sells uh, six of them, we have to eat the cost of the manufacturing and the shipping of the ones that didn't sell. All right, so we hold that on the side from the profits, okay, and we recoup that before we start paying you off of yours. But then we recoup the advance first, Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why as a producer, I'd always make a contract that my royalties start from record one after you recoup the recording budget only. I don't care what you gave the artist. That's not my job. Okay, my job is to work off of whatever I worked upon. All right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the opportunities now. I have just one more question. Yes, follow up go on ahead. That. So did you find, I'm imagining because you ended up with pretty incredible career in the music business. I imagine that you 
that is a, that was a per- pretty sophisticated way of looking at it when you were working with Rufus and you were working those deals. Did you find that the musicians of that time were as sophisticated as you were in terms of the business and the creativity? We, we knew people smarter than us, but they didn't have the content. Okay. We knew people that were a lot smarter, smarter attorneys, smart people that had been in the business for a while, and they were always on the lookout for material. They were always on the lookout to find that group that does well like Mother's Finest. There was other groups that came out and they said, oh, they're just like Rufus. No, they weren't. You know, but it's like, it's like when you become a reasonable facsimile of the original, when the original dies, you go just as quick. So if you can, if you can niche yourself, in other words, if you can get to an area that it's only you, it's like when Gladys Knight left Motown, where did she go? She went to Buddha Records because there was no other black females there. Okay, who ran Buddha at the time she went? Neil Bogart. Neil Bogart is the one who made Casablanca Records that okay. signed Donna Summer, all right? Okay. That kind of mind. You know who Bob Krasnow was? Bob Krasnow was the president of Elektra Records. Okay. Before that, he'd had Blue Thumb. And Blue Thumb signed Dave Mason, the Pointer Sisters, and the Jazz Crusaders, all right? And he was up to be vice president of Warner Records with Mo Austin as president. And Mo didn't pick him, he picked Lenny Warnaker, who wasn't as musical as Krasnow or as Ed Rosenblatt, who was the other one up for the job. Ed Rosenblatt, the very next day, was hired by David Geffen to help start Geffen Records. So the people Mo passed on were the people that heads and tails could have taken Warner's even higher. Krasnow went to Elektra Records. On his first day, he signs Metallica and Nina Simone. What an eclectic fuck. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the same guy I signed Natalie to for Unforgettable because it made sense to him. It didn't make sense to anybody else. But he was already eclectic. He already knew different things. Even if he didn't know the music, he had a sense on whether it was, we're not worthy. He had a sense if it was worth something, you know. He, he was the mix of a lot of the people that, that I know and that I had to become, a mix between commerce and creativity, where you, you know enough to be able to speak with people that only have dreams of sales, as well as uh, uh, you, you wind up being a liaison between creative side. That's why when I worked as senior VP of a r at MCA, creative people had no problems divulging or telling me things because they understood the nature of how I existed. They knew I wasn't there to stop them from getting money. I was there to make make the connection between the two work for both sides. So that that was kind of the that was kind of the, the routine. Sophistication is based on an overview. It's like if somebody looks at your life or my life and says, you guys do so much every day. If that's what you do every day to you, that's, that's, not, a, a, that's not a big deal. It's standard procedure. It depends on who's looking. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Or the way I grind and I get with people who are constantly complaining about they're busy all the time. When you're a grinder, you don't complain. It, it, what you're doing comes with the territory. It's just part of it. And if you don't get off on certain aspects of that. So we tend to think as Americans, not just as musicians, but we all try to level jump. We all try to get to a certain level where there's an easy chair involved. Mm -hmm. That's not life. Mm -hmm. It's in a constant state of flux. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get off on the flux, what, what you smile is, is to be able to survive in it all and prosper or to thrive Mm -hmm. or to have, um, what you need as opposed to what you want. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, your, your, your needs are simpler than you think. Your wants are usually ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Okay, so th- there's always a fight between that. Remember the cartoons as a kid? What happened when there was a quandary about the villain or the good guy? What popped up on his shoulder? Devil. It was an angel and a day. devil. Who was in the middle? The character was. Mm-hmm. That's us. Yeah. Our day is spent in a push-pull between lies, truth, temptation, uh, fulfillment, we're, we're, we're constantly there and, and our life is in the middle, it's in the balance. 
And, when, and then when we get balanced, the mistake we make is we want it to go on an even keel forever. Okay, it doesn't work like that mm -hmm. because the time spent here is too quick. I know rocks older than me. I've been to Kyoto in Japan. I lived in Tokyo. I went to Kyoto and the guy said, this temple's a thousand years old. I said, damn, I'm just trying to get to 40. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So people don't encompass that. Mm -hmm. My father gave me worldview, and that's what I give to my students and my children. A worldview encompasses more than your neighborhood. If you're neighborhoodly, that's where you'll stay. Mm -hmm. Because those are the only parameters you've given yourself to explore. Okay, so you, you have to step across lines. It's like, uh, I have an ex-wife. Uh, why are you cleaning up? Is somebody coming over? I said, no, I live here. So it has nothing to do with who views me. It has to do with What's my level of the quality of my life? That's what I'm interested in. Because I can't control once I leave my door. All I can control is my immediate environment. And it's comfortable for me. But at the same time, I know when I leave that door, anything can happen. You know? Mm -hmm. And there's a way to be ready for it. One, not being scared to die. Mm -hmm. and, and understanding that the biggest fear we have as, as parents or as grown folks is that we pass away before we've imparted enough information to our children for survival. Yeah. That's our biggest fear. You, you know, you got daughters, so do I. I got three daughters and two sons and nine grandkids. So it's like my real job, all this stuff we're talking about, it's wonderful. I love talking about it because I've experienced it. I don't make up things. I will share and relate, but I don't have time to make up shit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but, but the biggest job I've ever had in my life is dead. So, you know, the importance that it is to me is important when I make it important. It's just like going into court and they say, stand for judge, you know, uh, Clarence Thomas. If I know he's a crook, I, I don't care. The only time it means something to me is if it means something to me, okay? Mm -hmm. So you, you have to ask yourself these questions. As far as music is concerned, you can't go wrong if you covet your culture. How long can you sell your sister before you have to call her a hoe? You, you can't, it's, it's not about sales. Sales is a byproduct. Money is a byproduct. The primary is completion of an idea. And when that mind knows it can complete it and it has the capacity to do these things, it empowers you, okay? It's like, even on a bad day, because of all the things we've all experienced and been through, even on a bad day, we're still better than most. Because if it were that bad, and if we couldn't deal with it, we would have been gone a long time ago. You would have been nine the time you just missed getting hit by the bus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in other words, how did we escape all these things? Mm -hmm. Either there's a plan for us, or we're just some lucky motherfuckers, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> You know, it's, it's that, but getting back to specifically what you talked about again, the, the, the members of Rufus were smart men, they are to this day. So when we got together, our thinking wasn't musical thinking, it was common sense thinking. You know, it was like, well, how would you feel if you work somewhere and instead of somebody trying to get to your office, they said, come see us, we'll give you dinner, we'll take you out. And we all looked at each other and we said, I, that would be cool with me. I'd take a chance. I'd go check yeah. them out. So that's how we tested each other. Yeah. In other words, it wasn't as much deep thought as just what makes sense because we're talking about human beings. Yeah. Okay? And we, we tend to talk ourselves out of ourselves. Either that or we live in our heads and our body becomes only a shopping cart. You know, you got to live in this world. And, uh, and this world is crazy. It's like, you know, watching China and Russia and and, and testing out new weapons in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Crimea. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on that, that is, uh, or the 13 guys who got together on the island uh, before the Federal Reserve was made. There's, there's, there's all kinds of things if you, if you wanna go beneath the surface. 
the majority of Americans and the majority of musicians do not want to go beneath the surface. There's a comfort zone in being creative and making your songs and rehearsing and knowing what the gigs entail and you got to lift the shit in the back of the van. I mean, there's a safety in that because you've gone so far in those parameters. As soon as you want to communicate beyond the limits of where you live, your mind has to shift into another gear. Then you have to become worldly and not neighborhoodly. But if you come to me and I'm at a record company, plus they keep looking at record co companies as Sven Gottlieb. Half the people who run record companies are attorneys. They're not creative people. Their dreams are different. Okay, so if, if you don't know what the fuck you're doing before you go in, they can't be your surrogate. You can't pay someone to be more concerned for your well-being than you. Ray Parker will tell you to this day, no one signs his checks, any of them, even to pay his bills than him. He's got an accountant, all those people, but they, they send him the book to sign the checks. He watches everything, okay? Uh, when, when Alan Reitman asked him to make a song for Ghostbusters, Alan was the, using the Huey Lewis tune as a demo uh, on, the, on the rough, on the dailies, right? Okay, Ray said, well, you get me kind of close to, to Huey's shit here, you know? And he said, yeah, but I want a song just like that. And Ray said, well, if you're gonna take, go down that highway, you're gonna be responsible to deal with Huey and his publisher. They ain't coming after me. You asked me to write this shit, okay? And that's exactly what happened. And if you say, who are you gonna call? You gotta pay Ray Parker, okay? So everybody's been smart in their own way a long time ago, but the people who hipped him for what to do weren't all from a record company. They were just business people. This street, why do you think 50 Cent is so smart? The same energy he, he used or Jay-Z to sell some crack, they turned the energy around. Most American yeah. businesses didn't start out as legitimate. It's energies. Yeah. Yeah. It's positive and negative. Yeah. And it's also what becomes your medicine. What, what is your God? So let me ask you this. Was Chaka Khan a good business person? No. So she, was, so she had people around her that kind of protected her and no. guided her? No. no. So tell me about that. How she was, that? She was, she was earthen. She was more into incense. She was more into <laughs> co to cosmic thoughts. She dealt with the uh, Black Panther Party with the free breakfasts, you know, before Fred Hampton was killed. She was in a lot of different things. She's a little, um, she's a little cosmic child even as, as whatever her age is today. You know, that's another kind of person. We all have different kinds of people. Some leave us tragically, like Whitney. You know, and what bothers me too is a lot of entertainers we're familiar with, whether it be Elvis or Marvin Gaye, the way they've left us is through tragedy. It's almost as if, you know, some people, when, when somebody told me Prince died, one was sad and the other one said, well, you know, he was really that great, so I expected something like this. I'm like, what? That's an expectation? Tragedy? Get the hell out of here. So Shaka, Shaka's got common sense. And when she was getting high and totally jacking herself around, uh, that was to escape. You're talking to somebody who's done drugs before, too. It's, it's not the drug. It's what's making you trying to sedate yourself. What are you doing? You know, what are you, what are you giving yourself medicine for? What are you trying to get away from? That's the problem. And when you don't know how to cope or when there's anxiety again from fear of the unknown and, and no one guides you or there's not opportunities for you to have other options, you do the dumb shit. And the first thing we do is we wind up trying to take ourselves out. We don't understand that the miracle of life, especially for musicians or creative people, is the fact that you have that ability. It's not always what somebody gives you for it. It's the fact that you're able to do that. What, what a miracle. I bless you, you know, and, and, and to be able to communicate that with more than one person, that you find out there are other people just like you, that the thread of humanity connects us. And it's like you don't go to see a band and pay good money for it to go see a concert if you don't understand what they're doing. There's something that they're doing that you relate to. Why are you humming the words? 
What, what's the deal? It's shit you sing in the shower that you can't do with a light bulb on in front of 10,000 people. That's not your thing, but you have the same feeling mm -hmm. and you have the same uh, uh, emotion. That's what connects us. Mm -hmm. But there are some who are made to be sentinels and there's some who are made to be like uh, town criers, all right? So instead of looking at it at that level, we're busy trying to say, well, how much you give me for this? You know, <laughs> it's, always about, it's always about selling rocks. If tomorrow they said, no money, not even digital, okay? We're, we're gonna deal with chickens and we're gonna, you know, we're, we're gonna eat ducks and we're, we're gonna barter with, uh, with rocks. Mm -hmm. Motherfuckers would be in the street with rocks, man. I mean, that's, that's, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. It's like the Africans for all these years have told them, you know, your Tarzan needs to save you. You know, and that's the place we go get the cobalt. We need, we've kept the Africans, all the major c countries have kept the Africans in a, a state of flux because they need all the natural goods. France has been pimping big time. Belgium, King Leopold did, did more than Hitler did. You know, I, I mean, th there's always been somebody pimping, but th that's the nature of animals. Mm -hmm. It's just like the lion or, or the hyena does some shit. The hyena only does it in a pack. When you get them one on one, that you you can beat the shit out of them. All right. Some people do shit in a gang in the night, and other people do stuff in the daylight. You know, the best thing to do is if you covet your craft, first of all that you're proficient in it, you know you have due diligence in it, you're not scared to grind, just like COVID. Somebody said, you're gonna be inside for, for two months, man, or longer. I said, well, I got a practice pad. Yeah. <laughs> How many hours have we practiced? Yeah. When the kids were out shooting hoops and having fun and going to the movie, we're in a room going, paradito, paradito. Are you kidding me? We got so much grind, it's ridiculous, man. Mm -hmm. When people want to talk about patience or perseverance, mm -hmm. Musicians need to pat themselves on the back. We, we, have, we, we're, we have the most dreams, perseverance, work ethic. We, we have so much that we might as well be an army. If we, you know, it, go take that town. If we had to do it with music, we'd capture the town. No doubt. Musicians yeah. are something else, man, but the, we, we get lost. We get lost where, where the, the worth becomes how many people salute it or how much do you get paid for it and everything some of my friends have done only for money has failed terribly in other words there if there's a little purpose behind it it helps your obsession the way i finished unforgettable with, with natalie i had to be obsessed with it that's how i finished it it had to be something that had to be righteous because this was a woman who happened to be my wife it wasn't about an artist. It was somebody connected to me trying to say bye to their dad that was taken away from them too early. And their mom wasn't cool. Instead of bringing the family together, she sent them away. The mom was bopping the attorney and getting the husband to sign off on stuff that didn't belong to her. Mm. The kids find it out later. Mm. I'm not going to go into it. I already divulged enough. But the point is, is the person I wound up being with, in certain instances, was still a child. That pain was still there. And for them to say goodbye to their dad righteously, when we listened to the playback at the end of the production, and me and Al Schmidt, and Tommy LaPuma, and Natalie, we sat there and listened to it, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. No matter what it sold, no matter what happened after that moment, we knew that we stepped in. <laughs> we knew that we did our good job. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm proud of that, mm -hmm. you know. How many times do you get a chance to say that without it being competition? He made a touchdown. You know, it wasn't none of that, mm -hmm. okay? And when it sold, that was, like, uh, it, that was like a happy coincidence as opposed to, I told you. It, none of that, okay? But everybody operates on, on different levels. I'm quite sure the people in promotion, marketing, and manufacturing weren't thinking, oh, this is nice. They were like, we got to sell this shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's just different energies, different times. Yeah. It, 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 it's all back to that angel and devil on the shoulder. It's all back to balance. Because you, you need a combination of things to make things happen. 
Uh, remember what I told you about, I'm cleaning the house and somebody said, there's somebody coming over. There's another thing too, that sometimes people act as if creative folks are like gamblers in Las Vegas. It's like they have an affliction. Uh, it's like they're gambling. But what they don't realize, what I told another ex-wife, uh -huh. what was, was uh, I'm not gambling on what I'm trying to do. The gamble is me. I'm gambling on me. And that's what she wasn't gambling on. She gambled on what I acquired, not on who I was. And with musicians, it has to be who you are, not what people think of you, or not what is expected, but what you expect of yourself. Okay, the business part, I can break those parts down. You know, it's the game, uh, but too many people play the game without content. You know, it's like you sit down in a card game and everybody, you know, just to get in, each hand's $5,000. And you sit down with a bad hand to begin with. You got no business in the game. You know, you think because somebody told you how to play cards that now you know the game. That's not the game. What's my tell? Who's bluffing? All right? Who's counting cards? You know? Who's getting a reflection in their glasses? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. it, you have to be aware of it. But as animals, you know, fight or flight or third eye open for your children as a parent, you know, seeing certain situations that you're not going to put your children in. It's a constant state of readiness. And that's part of survival. Or I don't always believe when people say, well, you rest when you die. Yeah, of course you do. But, but there's a, there's a, Time to rest and there's a time not to. Yeah. And the point is, is even if you think that I'm going too hard, I'm happy. You know, and part of it is this, your, your state of your life. Are you happy with your life? You know, it's also getting harder and harder with the state of our country. Because, you know, we live in an environment and sometimes even with a lot of stuff going on, we've been able to get away from it because we got a little space. And when they say we're overpopulated, we're not. The city centers are overpopulated. The country as a whole is not overpopulated. We have enough food to feed everyone here, yet we don't. Yeah. To have homeless people or hungry children, there's no excuse for them. So in other words, when people are telling me about getting a record deal, I'm saying, dude, you got a lot more work to do than just that. Yeah. Okay, if you just want a record deal, <laughs> you could starve to death to get a record deal. Yeah. You know, plus the if you're an active musician, the time you starve the worst is when you're not getting money for playing live. And you're woodshedding because you're trying to get songs ready to become some record. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That's the poorest time for Rufus as a group was to prepare to make a record. That was the poorest time because we weren't working. Before then, how did we make our money? We made money off royalties, but our main income came from performing live. We used to do 5.45s a night. When somebody said, Bruce Springsteen's doing three hours, I said, yeah, that's two hours short than he used to do at my father's place in Long Island. And the Beaver Brown Band and all those bands. You know, Bruce used to do three, four hours a night. So I said, well, it's just a, it's an hour short of his normal show. You know, like that was a big deal. With Rufus, man, we'd do an hour concert, open it for Elton John. We were warmed up. We go back to the hotel, it's like, <sighs> okay, yeah. we go down to the hotel uh, uh, lounge, yeah. pay the musicians to take a break. And then the roadies would bring some gear from the truck. We'd play all night long. Mick Jagger would come down, Patti LaBelle came by when we were in London. I mean, it was like a jam. After the gig, every night, if we were in a place that had a hotel with a big band room, that's where we wound up. You know, and, and <laughs> Mick was so funny. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, it, but Charlie Watts, me and Charlie would hang. Because Charlie was a jazz aficionado. He loved mm -hmm. jazz mm -hmm. drumming and jazz big band. Mm -hmm. And we'd talk about that all the time. You know, and one day he said he wanted to do that. I, eventually, I think he did make an album or two with some big band. And Owen Phil Collins got into that. But I, to me, drummers make good producers because they know everybody's part. Yeah.
But uh, I, re I remember those times where it wasn't like who these guys were. We were all musicians. That's how I was able to produce Nina Simone. If I treated her like a diva that everybody else was, she, she would have done just that, been the diva. Yeah. I dealt with her as a fellow musician and I talked to her and treated her as such. That's all she wanted, mm -hmm. was the respect that she didn't get from the music conservatory that refused to, to let her come in in Philadelphia. That started her, her whole thing about, I'm better than that. You know? Part of her attitude was, you know, uh, you didn't let me in. Like, you know, that drove her. Yeah. And as she got older, she didn't need that anymore. Yeah. A lot of times what drives us is a combination of goulash and some shit we've been carrying around in a bag for years. Yeah. And after a while, there's too many flies and smell following you, so you need to get rid of something. Mm -hmm. The whole thing about maturity is being able to make those decisions or get those inspirations without bringing all the extra stuff you used in the past to, to make that formula for you to have action, okay? Yeah. Uh, it used to take certain things for me to get up and do stuff. Now I can just take one piece of it that you know, is the that you've boiled the essence down, and that's all I need. I stop carrying around bags of shit. You know, there's a lot of people. Just close your eyes and think about all the people you know. That's all they talk is shit. Just picture them as being this little thin waif of a person looking like they're starving, yet they're carrying this giant bag behind them. It's full of shit. Mm -hmm. It's a waste of time. Um, the, the, the record companies can be broken down, which is easier now, because a lot of deals are distribution deals. A lot of deals is you distributing me, not manufacturing me, not giving me an advance against record sales, but you are distributing the record. In essence, we're making a deal where I provide the product and you provide the distribution for it. Uh, the 50-50 deals, or when Madonna, I think with the, uh, what's the, uh, uh, what's the live, what, what's the, uh, uh, the one who does concerts, live something? Live Nation. Live Nation. When Live Nation first did, I think, the deal with Madonna, where they, they get a piece of all the different aspects of what she did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, th there's ways to deal with that. But as far as, uh, uh, as a record company, if you came to me, even, even back in the 90s, and you were an artist, you wrote your own tunes, you did your own recording, uh, just like Renee and Angela. Uh, they, had, they used their budget to make a recording studio. So after a while, any budgets given them for a recording, they put in their pocket. They knew it was recoupable, but so what? And, and also, they brought Bruce Swedeen in to mix their stuff. The way they got him was they gave him a percentage instead of just a fee. Quincy only gave Bruce a fee, okay? The way I got Al Schmidt when he worked on Unforgettable, I gave him a percentage. That's how I could guarantee that he was there for the, for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you treat people. Yeah. But wh what I'm saying now is getting a distribution deal. In essence, you put together how you want to appear, okay? And, and you put that together, you get it distributed. And then the game is to learn all the different ways how to market and promote. All right, and you have to be visible. It's not that we'll build it and they'll come, okay? People are fickle, okay? And they tend to go with something they think's a winner. They go with things that they don't have to think too deeply about. It's very fragile. that's a word I always make up. Yeah, and, and um, the, 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 the way to deal with that is the problems we have is we remove ourselves from being people too. We become elitist or become regulated in only what we do and we've compartmentalized everything else. You can't. You kind of have to be a jack of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like when you see those apocalyptic movies and the guy who's making it is like the guy who, you know, opens his jacket and he's got watches and he's got a nice and he's got a frying pan. He's, that's how you make it. Mm -hmm. You know, in essence, all the things I've done in music have been offshoots. To be a dean at a college, to teach music business is still an offshoot of, of my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. To be a musical director, I was musical director for Etta James and for Anita Baker and for a bunch of different people. How do you do that? It, it's still involved with music. Yeah. You know, arranging, producing, orchestrating, they're all connected with creativity, with music, overview, inside view. Um, 
It's like David Foster. David's a great producer, very famous. He's not a mixed producer. In other words, he gets an engineer he trusts and then he goes and does something else. I'm, to me, I can't do that. To me, part of mixing and part of putting that together, all the records you heard Shaka do while I was there, my finger was on the fader of the, of the voice. My father said, what are you selling? He said, if you got this guitar loud and this string line, he said, that was arranged to accompany the story. Now you got, you got the company louder than the story. What are you selling? Right. Okay, so it's the same way if you listen to Unforgettable, the vocal's right here. I, and Schmidt looked at me, I'm mixing with Al Schmidt. He says, Dre, Dre, Dre. He gave me a little Brooklyn, you know, a little Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, yeah, you got the vocals up here, man. I said, give me a minute. I took a break, it took about 10 minutes. I'd already planned on this. I came in with about seven, eight recordings, okay? Seven, eight recordings. This uh, Masquerade, George Benson, um, Perry Como, uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, um, uh, Neil Young. Uh, Schmidt was the engineer or the producer. Schmidt produced Jefferson Airplane. Okay, he did Breakfast at Tiffany's, Hatari, Peter Gunn. He did all that shit, okay? So I played him his own records back. <laughs> And the vocal was right here. I said, that's where the fuck I got that from. <laughs> and he did just like you're doing now. He laughed. Yeah, yeah. He understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, he said, he said, Natalie saying buy me or dad. That's what we're selling. Yeah. And that's exactly, that's exactly what came to him. But that opinion and how I just expressed it to you, was that musical? Was that record business? Or is that, that's some, it's just humans. It's creative. So it, as soon as you as soon as you categorize yourself out of everyone else, then you're not in touch anymore. Yeah. The only way to know what people want is you got to be people too. Yeah. You know. Uh, so go ahead. It's about we're about wrapping up here. Okay. Um, but I was thinking about you know if you're one of those cats that's you've seen it all. You you know your history goes back. 15 hey, years. I ain't done yet. <laughs> I know you're not. I know you're not. But and that's why I'm, that's my purpose of my question is. I, I guess how do I frame it? What do you what do you see now going on, especially with with social media? You mean if the world doesn't come to an end? The world doesn't come in. What do what do you see now going on with the so, with social media that's positive, and or negative, and. What do you see? The f what would you recommend? Because I know most of these artists and musicians are promoting themselves, trying to get that train, that proverbial train you 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 speak of, going, moving, yes. right on their own, yes, via social media. Mm -hmm. What what do you recommend? Is there anything you, that you see that you could be like, you know what, that they're doing that right and they're doing that wrong? This is the way I see it. Uh, we, we, we tend to narrow the bandwidth because again, that creates less anxiety. The point is, it's anything that you can think of. Okay, the answer is not do A and B. The point is, what the fuck else can you think of to do? Okay, the thing with social media is, one, it can be used as a reason for there's a lack of human communication between human beings, and it's vicariously done through social media, as opposed to the fact of, now here's a medium which means you can instantly communicate with people, period. So in other words, you can always flip the script depending on how you're approaching it, all right? Again, if your content is weak, you can show it to as many people as you want, and that's all you're doing is showing it to them. It's like a guy with a bad speech. It can be all over the place, okay? It, it, it won't necessarily make somebody agree with you. If your content is smoking, is it whacking, or if it's weird, or if it's different, and plus you, you can't control what people want. All you can do is expose them to what you think has merit, or, or, or is communicating something in which we all go through. We forget that sometimes. We unique things out of the box when basically sometimes it could be just basic. 
if somebody talks me a sad song, gives me, let me hold you tight if only for one night, Brenda Russell, which Luther Vandross wound up covering. I did the original with Brenda and when she talked the words to me, it made me feel a certain way. And then when she sang it with just the piano, there was, there was a melancholy to it. There was, there was a slight tear in it, as well as whatever the um, other emotional content was. Well, my job was to make the music and the arrangement also uh, convey the same thing. It had to marry it. If not, it, it was push-pull, it wouldn't work. So it, that's what I did. And I studied it. And also, she's a keyboard player, which means just like Roberta Flack or Alicia Keys, they give themselves what they need, even without a band. Okay, so they sing their cadence according to how they play. The more you can take their style of what they're doing and put it in the other instruments, the more you stylize the track around them, which makes it unique and it doesn't sound like anybody else. The music arranged for Shaka was around the way she sang and how we arranged it, okay? Alicia's that way, Brenda Russell was that way. Brenda Russell's left-handed, which means what? Most keyboard players, what's a left hand? It's an incidental. Even though it's a root bass note, sometimes they play it as if it's an incidental. Their main thing is the right hand, right? The melody or their chord. Brenda's left-handed, so the bass was just as important to me, her drops, and she liked eighth notes, and, and her chords were based upon what her left hand drop was. I make the bass player play her left hand, which he vehemently disagreed with mm. because that's not how a bass player approaches the bass based upon his instrument. He doesn't base it upon how the keyboard player plays bass. So I said, if you give her herself back, she can stand up off the piano. If you don't give her what she gives herself, she's locked to it. Mm which means she won't even try anything different rhythmically or vocally if she's not getting what she normally needs anyway, okay? So you hear the doctor talking? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I was taught that by learning the art of accompaniment by old folks. My mother would make me play on brushes on a magazine while she sang while doing dishes. Mm -hmm. We'd trade fours. And she'd say, playing is like speaking, son. And sometimes if you have nothing to say, you need to be quiet. And we'd, we'd go through certain things and she talked in, in music and vocals in terms of color or textures. Herb Alpert talks that way. He'd talk about a mix and he'd talk, it's blue here. And, you know, he'd go through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. you know, and and, and I, I appreciate those textures. Even though my father would give me the technical and the, the, the flat five and the sharps and the whole routine and I'm playing trumpet, trombone. I'm, I'm a trombone player even though mm. I play drums. And, and I, I play what they call arranger's drums. In other words, if I'm writing a song, I play the drums good enough for me to give me what I'm looking for in the song. With Rufus, if you solo my drum tracks, turn them up, you hear me humming the song. I'm just playing the song. Where a lot of drummers are playing beats I'm playing a song. I consider myself a musician and not a necessarily just a drummer. So it, it depends on how you view the things. Anyway, getting back to the, uh, to, to, to putting things together, th there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way to, to do things, especially with the future coming up. Even though the future is bringing us more technology, it's bringing us problems and smart things and, and easier ways to do things or, or, or different ways of doing things, you keep getting away from content. You know, it's like a mediocre lyric is just that. Rap records, no one covers them. They cover vocal records. So if I'm a publisher, if I'm publishing songs, am I going to get returns off a quick rap record? Or am I going to get returns off a song? You know, and also people are more prone to listen for a vocal, even when a saxophone player plays in vocal range, it's, 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 uh, it's enhancing. We also forget that our bodies 
and the earth runs off frequencies. There's energy in frequencies. When you go to England, when Elton tunes the string section, they're not A440, they're 44 or more, where everyone tunes up. And when that hits the echo chamber, it doesn't sound the same, all right? So there's, there's frequencies that we run on. There's certain grooves that I play and a bass player will get into a certain mode or certain notes. And for some reason, those frequencies are like a trance. It's like you, you go into that place. They say that's what happened with Jimi Hendrix or John Coltrane. They found their right frequency and they just fucking played right on out. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, we got to remember those frequencies too. Sometimes you can mix the wrong frequencies and wonder why people don't like your shit. It's wrong frequency, man. Lower notes move the body. Mid-range is here. High frequency is the head. And if high frequency is not right, it hurts. So it's like even a good mix is frequency shelving. In other mm -hmm. words, when my mix is right, the frequencies do this. Mm -hmm. And I don't arrange shit in the, in, the, in the frequency of the storytelling. Biggest problem with putting mixes together is you've got frequencies fighting. So you're too busy EQing or panning to get shit out of the way. If you record it right in the first place and understand the nature of the frequencies, you don't have that problem. And also the art of accompaniment. Okay, there's so many things I can get into um, aesthetically or musically about how we put this together. Before you get to the game, will internet help you? Of course internet will help you. Anything that can get your word out, so to speak. But what we don't understand about the internet, just because you put it on Facebook, it's, it's better for Facebook Live and to promote the fact that you're gonna show it than just putting it on and hoping somebody saw it mm -hmm. or your friends, mm -hmm. okay? And are all those friends that you've gathered, I got 5,000 friends, are all of them gonna click on when I say I'm putting something out? No, okay? So you, you, you have to promote it. You have to promote everything you do, yeah. you know? And you have to do it in such a way that it becomes part of your everyday operations as opposed to a separation. Yeah. Creative people, they separate too much. Yeah. It's just like the same energy it takes me to talk with you or to make a record is how I cook my food and take care of my children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same level of expertise or making it balanced, mm -hmm. you know, you won't taste my shit and there's too much salt in it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you, you, those trans, transcribe onto everything that you do. Yeah. You gotta stop compartmentalizing and it winds up being positive and negative. It winds up being frequency shelving these are things that make you feel good. Yeah. It's like listening to 10CC or uh, Don't Go Change, uh, rearrange the Billy Joel stuff. If for some reason, certain songs you listen to, that just shit just feels good, man. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you feel an emotion. What a fucking thing to be able to do something that makes somebody feel something? Mm -hmm. My God! Mm -hmm. We talk about that all the time. Yeah, so, yeah. so I'm saying these are, these are all mixed in with myth histology, mystology, uh, uh, what really transpires. The business part is certain ways how to get things in front of someone's eyes or to be able to affect them emotionally or something about the human condition that, you know, I'm able to tap into that. That I get into, I can break that down, we can do it scientifically, talk about tests that have been done with music, talk about what happens to the baby in the womb, hearing the frequencies. I mean, I can go through all of that stuff. Why did it take them 40 years to do shit musicians knew all along? You have to play your violin to my baby's, my wife's stomach, you know? What was that gonna do? It's some positive shit, yeah. okay? So th there's, there's certain things that we instinctively know, and then just because it's technology, we, we put that on some other level. Well, a man designed it. Yeah. You know, it, that, that's the same fool that bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki mm -hmm. and also wound up how to, you know, hyponically grow a plant. Yeah. It's like on the one hand we're angels, on the other hand we're shit. Yeah. Okay, so you, you, you got to grab that balance. As far as social media is concerned, a social media could be a wonderful thing. 
especially if you have something positive which uplifts people or gives them something that they haven't heard or that's different. Yeah. You know, people get tired of certain things after a while, after all the same thing. To me, uh, no offense to hip hop or rap, but the earlier rap, uh, you know, when I'm listen, listening way back in the day, was positive. And it had a whole nother feel, even when Queen Latifah first came out. As soon as it was to the, to the gangster, in essence, that's, that's negative to, the, to what it was used for by that particular group of people. Instead of medicine, it turned into something else which someone else seemed to think was worth money. Okay, that changed the onus on it. And it, it, became, it became toxic. And then attached to it was money. Or to ask a young boy, why are you doing this? I want to get out of the neighborhood. I want to change my life. I want to buy my mom a house. That's n none of the people I came up with, whether it's Lionel Richie or Stevie or any of the older group of people, none of them came up with that in mind. Their music was the first of all was to be respected by fellow peers or musicians that they that they respected. For Mill Jackson to tell me that was good, Dre. I I, I was done. I could have retired that minute. Yeah. When Quincy said, yeah, "I want you to be VP," you know, of my record company, and, I, and you go do this for me, I'm like, "What the? F yeah, you know." In other words, that meant more to me than anything. Now it's, it's cheese, okay, which means uh, capitalism is not freedom. Capitalism is not democracy. Capitalism is just capitalism, okay? And there has to be a balance again between the angel and the devil to figure that shit out. And then when we have to go sell records, when we have to promote our art, there's more of a positive onus behind it as opposed to the biggest problem with musicians is when they have to now sell their product, there's a, there's a, the energy changes. Do you notice? Oh, yeah. It's all of a sudden there's, there's a quandary in their eye or there's a look or oh, I hope this does that. Mm -hmm. It's like hoping and wishing and maybe and well, they didn't promote it. And you know, all of a sudden something else comes over where when you made it, it was like, oh, isn't this great? Mm -hmm. You gotta keep mm -hmm. that going all the way through. If I'm going to sell you an artist, I come to you with an act, I'm not going to sell you an artist as if you, if you don't give me the money for it, it doesn't exist. See, I've seen people come in to sell me as an A&R man. Like, you know, please help me with this. Don't you love it? Because if not, you know, I don't know what to do because you can help me make this a hit. And to me, I listen to it just, I'm the same guy set up listening to Shaka playing with a local band, standing at the door, taking tickets, singing four songs a night, doing covers. You know, that same voice I heard, I heard all the other shit that came after it, all right? It was already in my head. You, you gotta think like that. You know, in other words, if I'm gonna sell you an artist, this, this is a train. This artist has a gift. This train is moving. I'm here to offer you a seat on the train. If you don't help me, this is going to happen anyway. Yeah. I'm offering you a chance to partake in this, to be part of this great thing, as opposed to, oh, please help me. If you don't, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> no, -uh. mm -hmm. because like I say, presentation, how you mm -hmm. present yourself. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to get grants sometimes because people don't believe, you know, in certain areas that I'm not solvent because my attitude is that of a shop foreman. I get that from my dad. It's a gift. I have nothing to do with it. I'm not in conscious control of the fact that people think, you know, every time I would walk in with Rufus, they said, are you the manager? Why can't I just, don't, why can't I just look like the drummer? Yeah. Why I gotta be that? It was my demeanor. The demeanor was like, he either knows what he's talking about, he's in control, or he's different. Or every time Andre comes in the room, something happens. Yeah. That's a gift. Mm -hmm. Just like Maria Issa, just like a lot of people that I deal with. That's why she got elected. Mm -hmm. Because when she came into a room, something happened. And people realized that, even if they didn't know what it was. Yeah. People like people to start fires. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been extremely good and positive. I think you put your positive mark on the world and you've gotten a lot more to do. 
and uh, go ahead. I'll do subsequently, I'll do any follow-ups you want, or oh, people yeah, have we'll specific see. questions, okay. if they want to okay. send you questions to be able okay. to answer, okay. and not answered philosophically. Oh. In other words, every, all my answers are not, you know, in the cosmos. Right. Th there are specific questions, everything from legalities, uh, to copyright forms that you can get at the post office, I mean, to trademark, um, uh, uh, distribution as opposed to signing directly to a label, um, the fact that um, make deals where there's no reserves, where money's not held over on the side if something else happens. In other words, where everything gets cleared out. Yeah. Uh, then there's the old Motown rule. Motown never made a track it didn't use. In other words, there was no wasted things. There wasn't a big uh, vault full of all these unreleased tracks. They, if, if the Supremes didn't sing Dance in the Street, Martha and the Vandellas did. You know, to be able to make things effective. Also, we don't think of ourselves in terms, I've heard some songwriters, their song would be perfect in a movie. Well, who's going to plug it? There, there are uh, uh, musical uh, directors and people that you can uh, send your songs to or are on constant lookout just to connect with them that say, well, you know, I, I've never heard of you before, but I got a few films coming up, send me something. They will do that. You know, yeah. Bonnie Greenberg, there's a lot of, of, of folks, Kathy Nelson, there's a lot of folks that I have. Kathy did uh, Dangerous Minds and, and got Coolio to do that song, you know, just out of her brain because she was on assignment having to get music for a film. Okay. Okay. Bonnie Greenberg has done everything, all the fitty thing you can think about. You know, uh, James Newton Howard, who's a great writer for film scores and, and uh, is quite a few others. They have started, you know, doing work on sessions. Yeah. You know, these people are, are available. And even though I was senior VP of A&R, you, you did, I didn't need a, a, a tape given to me that I had to know who was giving it to me. In other words, there wasn't a preference. Okay. You know, if I heard a guy singing in the subway in New York and if I thought he was jamming, I'd take him in and do a demo on him. It doesn't matter. Okay. If something's good, it's good. You, you didn't put parameters on it based upon where you saw it, what it was wearing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or if it had been a group before, or for yeah. some reason, people had, uh, they were always opposed to artists who came from Las Vegas. Mm. Uh, they had this idea that they're too showy. And I said, yeah, but you haven't even heard his songs yet. And also I found that when I went to the Philippines, there were more friggin' singers killing it mm. in the Philippines, mm. doing Whitney and doing, all, you know, the, the kid who took a, a, sure. a in, in Journey, but yeah. he, he, I heard him singing with Chicago. Mm. You know, uh, there's, there's a bunch of other, other folks that I heard as well. And then I tried to bring some, I remember, in the MCA, and they said, well, we don't know what to do with the Asian. Yeah. And I'm like, it's music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So a, a lot of things are, uh, limit themselves as far as that's concerned. But all I'm saying is that I'll do follow-ups with you. Oh, for sure. Uh, if people send in questions that yeah. there's... Mm -hmm. They're interested enough in what they heard that they want more specific information. Yeah. I got no problem putting it oh. down for them or contacting a couple of numbers or places, people or things that they can use as reference. Okay. Plus there's a, there's a book, a couple of books that a friend of mine in California puts out. And in there, there are numbers of lawyers, of publishers, of record company A&R, and yes, there's a cost for the book, but it's an accurate record that he keeps up up to date. Okay. And it sends me a, like a newsletter on the uh, music business and what's happening uh, electronically or uh, okay. you know technically. Okay. You know that I can turn people on to and they can subscribe to it because we're in a little hole here. Yeah. With Prince being gone and Jimmy Jam and Terry here locally, we don't have that many outlets. Now, some of the distribution hubs of these labels still are here mm. in town, but those are not A&R people. Right. But there are still some people here that can still get your tape to someone, okay? okay? And Ken Abdu, there's, there's a few other attorneys that are still here that were still involved at one time heavily in the music scene and still have that expertise, some entertainment attorneys. The one who produced a, a part of a Purple Rain was Craig Rice. Uh, who's in town and he's hooked up with the Minneapolis uh, Film Festival or the okay. Minnesota Film Festival, whatever it is, I think it's the Minneapolis Film Festival. He's one of the people who helps run it. This was a guy who, who managed some of the bands for Prince and at the same time produced that film 
you know, and he's he's in town, he's available. There's a lot of key people that are still here that are able to give some first-hand advice to, to locals. Cool. You know, because there's still a lot of talent here in Minnesota. I see it through the students who yeah. come through my program every day. Yeah. There's a lot of people, and I'm talking about singing, rapping, dancing, poetry, spoken word. Mm-hmm. There's some great a- actors and actresses. Yeah. You know, Rafael uh, Ruggier- Ruggiero, one of the uh, uh, students that came to us at Mobile Jazz at the Creative Arts High School. Um, I see he's been in a star of a little film. It was a Christian film I saw recently, and some other things that he's he's just gone on. You know nice. that that it's possible. You just yeah, need yeah. a little encouragement, a little information, and then we'll talk about luck another time. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. More than welcome.